Uh, the conversation today will not be drippy or boring in the least. Uh, many of you already know our uh, wonderful organizer, uh, Saeed Khan, and uh, it's, it's always a great pleasure to work with my dear friend and colleague. Uh, but so much of tonight was made possible by the British Council, and we're uh, honored to have a representative from the Council, Tim Rivera, uh, who will bring brief uh, greetings from the Council and introduce uh, uh, Saeed and Sean. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm Tim Rivera, I'm a Project and Partnerships Officer at the British Council based in Washington, D.C. For those of you who are not familiar with the organization, we are the UK's International Organization for Cultural Relations and International Education uh, Opportunities. Uh, at the British Council, I manage the Our Shared Future project under which this uh, visit is taking place. Uh, Our Shared Future is a project which is co-created uh, with the Carnegie Corporation of New York um, to really have a transatlantic conversation on intercultural relations, particularly those between Muslims and non-Muslims. Um, and so in the course of managing the project, I was really quite keen that we um, in, have some form of engagement here in the broader region of Southeast Michigan um, for, for obvious reasons, but particularly because it uh, sort of gelled so, so much with the situation which um, uh, which exists in the UK, particularly in a city like Leeds um, and another in Bradford. Um, Sean McLaughlin here is a professor um, at the University of Leeds uh, whose research is very much about looking at uh, diaspora populations in the UK, particularly the South Asian uh, population. His research will, I'm sure, sort of come out in greater uh, detail. Um, I was here in October sort of doing a scoping visit uh, for this current visit where I first met um, Saeed and I knew from within 30 seconds that, uh, that he would have to be involved in, in any such visit. So I'm really delighted to be here, delighted that you are, are all here, particularly given the uh, conditions outside. So I really appreciate you being here and I hope you will enjoy what I'm sure will be a delightful and engaging conversation. So with that, I will turn it over to Saeed. All right, thank you, Tim. Uh, thank you all for coming on uh, what hopefully will be a passing storm of, uh, of an evening uh, tonight. Uh, most of you are painfully familiar, maybe nauseatingly familiar with my talking, and some of you I see are from my class today, so you certainly heard uh, from me today. So what I thought we would do is start off with hearing from Dr. McLaughlin. Uh, some of you are familiar with me bringing in uh, Britain into, into class, particularly talking about identity issues. And I know for those of you taking my Ottoman history class, you're wondering, well, how can the contemporary possibly be, be relevant? But some of what we talk about in class deals with social history, deals with issues of identity, deals with issues of belonging. And more than anything else, what we're dealing with is an issue of the history or the study of migration of peoples and how when they come into new circumstances and into new settings, they have to interact adapt, oppose, uh, assimilate, sometimes clash, coexist, and uh, go through a process by which they, neither they nor the host area is ever really the same. Uh, this process of transformation occurs in many different manifestations, economic, political, legal, religious, cultural, sometimes linguist linguistic. And we find that in the case of the United States, we as a country are going through this process. And as we go through now what has been updated to be uh, 2043, the year that the United States becomes a majority minority country with the demographic shifts occurring, we find that these issues of demographic shift also face other societies. And perhaps there is no country on earth that has the issue of diversity, multiculturalism, uh, presented to it in a, I was going to use the word pressure cooker, but that's off limits these days, that's what happened. But in a sense, this, uh, this very confined area surrounded by water as the United Kingdom. 
And one of the things that Dr. McLaughlin will perhaps uh, be able to shed better light to is that for some of you, driving six hours means going from here to the far reaches of Chicago, and some of you will do that as a road trip over a weekend. In six hours, uh, one can drive from London all the way to Glasgow, Scotland, and you can pretty much drive across the entire country of Great Britain. So just to give you an idea of size and scale. And yet in this uh, society, we have a melting pot, or uh, some would say a tossed salad of different groups, different communities, coming together with different experiences, different histories. Uh, England being, of course, a colonial power, an empire in its heyday, and the diversity of its various publics coming together and trying to forge some kind of an identity, whether this identity is mixed, whether this identity is distinct. And we find that a lot of the issues are quite different than those faced in the United States, but there are some points of real connectivity. So we thought tonight we would look at issues of the general profiling character of the situation in England, the situation here in the United States, issues of Islamophobia, attitudes toward Muslims, government policies, both active, proactive, and reactive, uh, the role of Islamic organizations, and including Muslim uh, political and civic participation, and looking at how the phenomenon of transnationalism affects societies of Muslims in the United States, as well as in the UK, and at the same time affects the societies in which these groups find themselves. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to, uh, to Dr. McLaughlin. I have to say, uh, on a personal level, it's a real treat. Someone who is familiar uh, with his uh, work, uh, Dr. McLaughlin has been in my library before he has come uh, to this library. Uh, he sits, uh, unbeknownst to him, on uh, several shelves of my, uh, my personal uh, uh, book collection at home uh, in various manifestations as chapters or as entire edited volumes. So it's a real pleasure to see a lot of what he has to say reach its third dimension tonight as opposed to just the pages that I usually am familiar with. Thank you very much, Saeed. And thank you to Tim from the British Council. Thank you uh, to the uh, Centre for Citizenship Studies for hosting this evening's event. Um, thanks for coming. Um, I'm really pleased to be here in uh, Detroit. Um, it's fascinating for me to uh, come to a different context and see the uh, sorts of issues that Saeed has uh, outlined configured uh, in a different sort of way in a different locality. And for me, um, the study of locality is very much a starting point, the study of cities. Um, the British Council's programme uh, our Shared Future is very much concerned with challenging discourses uh, of Islamophobia, uh, generalisations about uh, Islam and Muslims um, that many of us that study Islam and Muslims close at hand uh, find uh, unsustainable and necessary to challenge. And in the scholarship that I'm involved in, um, that is an ethnographic approach um, a focus on the local, a focus on the city, a focus on its particularity and the particularity of its Muslims um, is a sure way of beginning to puncture uh, many of those myths about um, Islam. Because when we take the local as our scale, we're immediately confronted with diversity. So... If I look at the way that Islam and Muslimness is being negotiated uh, back in Pakistan, uh, which is where many of the respondents that I've worked with over the years um, find their origin, if I look at that context, and then I look at the context of Leeds or Bradford, these two cities in the north of England, um, I can see many commonalities, I can see many ongoing connections, but I can also see many transformations too. So in many ways I'm interested in the way in which in a globalisation context, um, the local is connected to many other people and to many other places. The Muslims that I work with in Bradford and Leeds are rooted deeply 
in a sense of um, their region in the north of England, in a sense of place in terms of their neighbourhood, and yet um, they are also deeply connected to, to their homeland and also to a wider, more nebulous space um, that we might identify in terms of a Muslim consciousness. And that was very interesting talking to some of Saeed's students, one or two of who uh, have made it back for a second session um, this evening. It was interesting to tease out with those students um, both their sense of rootedness in places like Dearborn, uh, but also the way in which um, tensions and affiliations back home played out here in the U.S., uh, and indeed um, began to imagine uh, broader Muslim unities. So, in very general terms, it's this sense of locality, it's this sense of uh, connectedness to uh, places and people elsewhere um, that is a starting point for me. And of course it's this, this sense of connectedness elsewhere, um, that begins to question, that begins to raise this question of citizenship. Um, very much associated uh, with the idea of the nation-state, uh, but in a transnational age, in an age of globalization, um, we begin to see the flows of people, of capital, of goods, of ideas across the borders of the nation-state, um, challenging um, this sense of belonging, of identity. And I think one of the key points I want to make is that very far from what is often targeted at diasporas, this sense of a dual uh, loyalty, a questioning of loyalty to the nation state. I think a key point really uh, to policymakers and so on is this sense of the normalcy now, the normal sense of connectedness uh, to one's locality, to one's nation, uh, but also to people and places elsewhere. Two further points, I think. One is that for me there's a real interest in the way in which religion gets configured in relation to national and to ethnic identities, to the homeland and to um, the sense of belonging uh, to new homelands here in um, the US, in the UK. And for me, uh, religion is a very mobile and interesting concept. It can both reinforce ethnic identity, it can reinforce uh, national identity, and there's a very strong tradition of that in the US if we go back to studies of the incorporation of migrants uh, of generations past and the work of Herberg or Protestant Catholics and Jews, how are they incorporated into American society? We have these multiple melting pots. Uh, and yet, too, particularly when those connections to the homeland begin to break down in ge generations uh, two and three and four and so on, and perhaps sometimes too. Uh, there's a sense of a tense relationship to the nation-state. Religion has this possibility of becoming a new focus for identity. Um, so many times when I meet uh, young Muslims, and they talk about disaggregating a religion and culture. So religion becomes a way of marking a sense of distinctiveness, um, when those connections to homelands begin to break down. But it's a motivator too, I find, for many young people to engage in a new politics of participation um, in um, somewhere like the UK. And I'm keen to hear whether this might be something that's a motivator too, in terms of uh, political participation here in the US. I mean, I think perhaps um, that, that may be a, a way of, of beginning to get some issues out there, Saeed, and I'm very happy to talk uh, about some of the particularities of the UK, um, depending on how you want to tease some of those out.
Okay, very good. Um, and like I said, we're going to have this be an organic conversation and then uh, certainly open it up to, to questions from you, so I hope that you're starting to percolate on those. Uh, on this last point about political participation that you raised, I think Muslim Americans are going through a, uh, an interesting situation because on the one hand, their own identity and their own place within the American narrative is being written uh, in real time. And yet at the same time, Muslim Americans are also witness to a particular moment in American history. And this is something that I raised in my introductory remarks. That as America is going through a major demographic shift, it is at times like this when uh, scholars like Cohen talk about moral panics. This notion of how a kind of a fear or an anxiety grows uh, and a specter of uncertainty and, uh, and foreboding then leads to a community or a nation, in fact, being susceptible to fear. Take back the night. Is that what it is? I think, yes. Wow, they it sure paint the, the right night. Oh, yeah. very good. Okay. Uh, and we see that um, it's particularly interesting that after this last election in the United States, that the commentary coming from some of the major opinion leaders was that traditional America is done. And of course, this is a buzzword for a particular meme or a particular conceptualization of what America is, what it was, and of course, by inference, what it always should be. Uh, the late Samuel Huntington, in his last book, Who Are We?, <coughs> describes this idea of America being essentially a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant nation. But 2012 did a lot to place a lot of damage to his hopes uh, of when he left and uh, escape this mortal coil, that uh, he, would, uh, he would still be comforted with the notion that this is the America that he left behind. 2012 was uh, the first year, according to the US Census Bureau, by which the United States now had the number of uh, non-Hispanic white births be less than the minority birth rate. Okay. It was also, according to the Pew Center for the Study of Religious Life, in October of 2012, the first time in American history whereby the uh, country is majority non-Protestant. Okay. It is also uh, the year when the census revealed that the Hispanic population is the largest single ethnic group in the United States, 52%. So if you take white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, you now have a society which is less white and more minority less Anglo-Saxon and more Latin American, less Protestant and more something else. So the very notion of this essential group called WASP, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, has now vanished. And the, the numbers are not going to reverse this at all. So you've got this demographic shift, and by 2043 it's going to be complete. You also have, at the same time, other demographic groups which, and again, if one saw and heard the rhetoric right after uh, the November election, there was a clamor, and in a sense also a resignation among some, uh, some voices, that there have been significant reconfigurations of the definition of marriage with the advent of the LGBTQ uh, community and its efforts. There has been a significant shift when it comes to racial identity, whether it is a Hispanic community or the African American community, uh, manifested, of course, with uh, the re-election of uh, Barack Obama, that even if they were going to rationalize the first one as a one-off, as a fluke, this time it is for real. We also have uh, new changes when it comes to reproductive and contraceptive rights being contested across the nation. And then, of course, also the power still, although certainly much less than what it used to be, of the nation's labor movement. So along these lines, when you have all of these factors, all of these different groups in flux, the question is, how is America going to change? What will it look like? And we find that Islamophobia, or what I would uh, propose as being called Muslimophobia, because it's a much more racialized discourse, becomes explicable because these other groups, whether it is based on race or ethnicity or 
on uh, socioeconomic or labor classification, or gender, or on sexual orientation, have a certain amount of social and political capital in the United States. They have a certain amount of economic, civic, and political participation in the United States. And the group which tends to then lag behind because of both numbers and uh, the post-9-11 narrative, as it has been scripted, are the Muslim Americans. And particularly damning for them was the 2007 Pew study which said that the number of Muslim Americans was not the 6 to 8 million which had previously been estimated, but was now 2.35 million. So going from about 3% million, uh, 3 of the population, or the second largest religion in the country, uh, to 0.6% of the population a population which is diversely and diffusely spread around the country and therefore cannot really posit much of a uh, political uh, impact on the elections. Yet paradoxically, they are apparently dangerous enough that there need to be these firewalls of anti-Sharia and anti-mosque legislation going up in states like Oklahoma, Tennessee, and even efforts being made in Michigan and about 17 other states underway. How then, within this construct, is political participation to be negotiated? On the one hand, it has intensified uh, a sense of vigor, a sense of necessity for Muslim Americans to participate in the political process based on the idea that the system does work. That there is underlying that, not just an optimism, but for lack of better words, a faith that the American political system can yield, as it has for the predecessor groups, a window or a, a space within the American civic society. That there are several different ways by which this can be implemented and exercised. One can be at the ballot box, and another can be in the kind of civic participation. So you see then that there is a renewed interest for Muslims to participate. And by and large, the, uh, the statistics, although not provided by the census, of Muslim political participation in the last several elections has been quite high. In uh, polls and, and surveys that have been taken by the community, it has been somewhere uh, between uh, 60 to 80 percent political participation among registered Muslim American voters. So there is then this correlation of saying that it is not a lost cause, there is not a sense of despair that this is something that can achieve a certain result, and perhaps more importantly, it is the only way to go ahead and do so. That's one important thing to recognize. But the other is on a civic uh, scale. The American Muslim identity is something that is highly contested, and in many ways it is a fluid and unwritten future for what it will look like. Part of the difference between what is the situation in the UK and in the US is that there really has been two different Muslim identities in the United States. One which begins before the conventional narrative is written, and that of course is the African uh, American Muslim experience. One that begins well before the large influx of immigrant Muslims. So you find a movement which begins within the US uh, by and large through the Nation of Islam as a liberation theology uh, during the civil rights struggle of the 1960s. Uh, figures like, of course, Elijah Muhammad, Malcolm X, uh, Louis Farrakhan, and Muhammad Ali are some of the names uh, which are associated with uh, the Nation of Islam. It's interesting and important for especially immigrant Muslim Americans to remember that 1965 was not only a, not only a watershed year when the Civil Rights uh, Act is passed, but it coincides then with the uh, relaxation of immigration quotas, particularly from South Asia, Southeast Asia, and, uh, and Africa. And so this is when your grandparents or your parents start to uh, migrate to the United States because there is, well, not yours, but, uh, 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 to the United States because there is now a greater window of opportunity. And those who are able to come, come from a uh, pool of by and large uh, professional class because there is highly specialized uh, occupations which are given preference within these visa categories that are opened up. So as they come, they are not coming to a tabula rasa. They're not coming to a blank slate of a country that is devoid of an Islamic narrative. Unfortunately, though, when they do come here, 
they are either completely oblivious to the existence of this Muslim American narrative that already exists, partly because it is an urban phenomenon. It is a phenomenon that for us in Detroit would be considered, quite literally, a south of eight mile phenomenon. Whereas the influx of immigrant Muslims, especially during the 1960s, 1970s, and subsequent, come to the areas north of eight mile. And I use that both as a metaphor and, and, and as a literal line of demarcation. That the socioeconomic distinctions bear in mind then the opportunity for interaction between indigenous Muslims, by and large African American Muslims, and those who are coming as immigrants. That is one major factor in then this lack of knowledge of this American Islam already existing. The other thing, unfortunately, is also an issue of authenticity. Because the nation of Islam did not resemble mom and pop Islam from the home country, uh, because it was seen as a liberation theology and one whose cultural practices, as well as its doctrinal practices, bore little resemblance other than some of the names and the iconography of conventional Islam, this created another barrier. It was a kind of Islam that is, uh, uh, from a conversation earlier, uh, similar to Christian yoga. It seemed oxymoronic or almost contradictory in, in its terminology. So there was a, an arm's length distance that many immigrant Muslims placed uh, when it came to African American Muslims. And thirdly, and I think that this has to be said as a matter of intellectual honesty, there was a racial component. There was a disincentive for immigrant Muslims to align with African American Muslims because they saw them to be a marginalized member of society. It was certainly more prudent for them, in their estimation, to try to incline in uh, the pursuit of upward mobility toward white America. And this is why after 9-11, when a lot of uh, immigrant uh, Muslims went to their African American Muslim counterparts and said, you know something about this whole civil rights thing because we are certainly getting uh, slammed by it, help us out. There was a certain amount of cynicism and skepticism by African American Muslims saying, well, let me guess, for the last 20, 30, 40 years, you were spending all of your energy and resources trying to act quote unquote white, and now you finally come to us when you recognize that we're even be more better off than you are. Because we can code switch into asserting our African American identity first, which gives us a kind of immunization from critique because of the racial history and our investment in it to overcome that. So people will think twice before they get into our grill about being black American. And as a result of that, our Islam is actually more preserved and protected. You don't have that cover because you are pretty much out there naked with your own visible minority status. Fortunately, over the last 12 years, that bridge has been uh, building between these two communities. But socioeconomics still plays a very large role in keeping them apart. And this is why, prior to 9-11, there was a split in the political persuasions of the Muslim community. And some would then argue that these votes were canceling each other out. The African-American Muslim community voted, by and large, Democratic. And in very large numbers, estimates somewhere along the lines of 90%, even in the 2000 election in electing George W. Bush, the immigrant Muslim community was voting for the Republican Party because they bought into this mythos of put yourself up, pick yourself up by the bootstraps, self-reliant, business, entrepreneurial, socially conservative means that are part of the Republican Party. After 9-11, this changed dramatically and we find that there's much more of a convergence of political participation whereby immigrant and uh, indigenous Muslims are starting to vote uh, generally as a bloc. Now enter into this fray the new group, which are yourselves, those who consider themselves neither to be indigenous because they, have not, uh, they, they don't exactly uh, uh, comport to Anglo or African American uh, Islamic identity, but nor are they really immigrant because they happen to have been born here. So this between class, or the 1.5 uh, generation immigrant class, that's where the real intersection lies, and this is where the most synergy is occurring right now. And this is also coinciding with their struggles to uh, figure out an, 
effective way to be political participants in the American narrative, it is also they who are at the forefront of trying to understand how to forge an American Muslim identity. And part of the issue then becomes a matter of understanding cultural production and cultural authority. For African American Muslims, cultural production was a no-brainer. They had cultural icons. Part of it was from within the tradition of the African American community or even more specifically the African American Islamic community. Malcolm X, Muhammad Ali, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, they could all be visible as Muslims as well as maintain their racial identity as well. And as I mentioned before, there is that deference that is given because of the rather sordid racial identity. But when it comes to the immigrant Muslim community, where is it? There is this anxiety about either appropriating from the African American Muslim community, and it is happening. After all, one of the most popular across the board figures within the American Muslim community among your generation is Lupe Fiasco, the hip hop artist. He is able to transcend these lines of demarcation of immigrant, indigenous, etc. But the question then becomes that even if there is a cultural authority which is being forged, whose is it? Is it something that Muslim Americans can go ahead and forge together? What will it look like? Will it be in the realm of fashion? Will it be in the realm of cuisine? Will it be in the realm of music, which is a highly contested issue among some because of the doctrine theologically about it for some reason? Is it going to be some musical icon? Where is the Muslim Kumar? To quote from the Harold and Kumar movies. Does he, in fact, exist? Where is the lovable marijuana-toting toking, uh, uh, person who is then accepted as a cultural meme in popular culture? These are some of the questions that have to be asked. And yet, at the same time, Muslim American youth are also being forced upon them. The cultural authority of Pakistan, the cultural authority of Bangladesh, and perhaps this overarching meta-narrative of the cultural authority of Saudi Arabia. So how are they going to then, on the one hand, try to beat this back with a stick when there are pressures coming from parents and other groupthink me uh, mechanisms to say, no, this is for some reason a more authentic form of Islam? Well, it's not a more authentic form of the theological aspect of Islam, but they are made to think that it's a more authentic part of the cultural Islam. But of course, it does not have the historicity in America. But there is a danger of how the cultural authority which is being produced elsewhere is going to have a very malignant effect on America. Now bear with me on this one. Across from the Grand Mosque in Mecca, Saudi Arabia, there is a mega mall that is open with a 1,400-foot clock tower. Has anyone built, been to this mega mall? Okay. Paris, yeah? Paris Hilton opened up a boutique the Paris Hilton. She opened up a boutique at the Mecca Mall. Now, you go down to your big malls in America, and most Muslim American parents, as they're walking down the mall, and they see the Paris Hilton store, will tell their kids, no, 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 you can't go in there. That's sleazy. Kids themselves may be self-regulating and say, yeah, you know what, I, I can't do that. I know internally there's something wrong with it, almost reflexive. Those same kids go for the pilgrimage to Mecca. And they decide, after they perform their pilgrimage, they're going to go to the mall. And here, literally in the shadow of, well, actually now the Grand Mosque is in the shadow of this mall, they encounter the Paris Hilton Boutique. And at least some of them are going to have the thought that if it's so close in proximity to the, uh, the holiest site of Islam, maybe there's something lawful about it. Maybe it is not off limits. So that that cultural production in America boomerangs its way to Mecca, comes back laundered into the United States, and now all of a sudden, Paris Hilton becomes halal for the Muslim American youth. <coughs> you see the danger then of a borrowed or a, a, a turned uh, cultural authority. No, I just wanted to make sure that we're able to get a sort of a, a similar narrative arc, if you will, um, from, the, from the UK side. Right. Well. So, back to you. <laughs> well, I mean, so many different uh, things that you touched on there. I think the first thing, perhaps, is to 
highlight that uh, in terms of the UK, we're also looking at a very similar population size. So I think you mentioned 2.35 million uh, Muslims in a country as large as the US. Uh, in Britain, 2.7 million uh, Muslims uh, in a much, much smaller country of about 60 or so million. More generally, um, about 15 to 20 million Muslims um, have come and settled in Western Europe. And really, whereas we look at the US uh, as having uh, very many different uh, migrant groups, many with actually a Christian background, um, in Europe it's been um, a Muslim-dominated process. So when people think about immigration to Western Europe in the post-war context, it's been very much a Muslim phenomenon. And moreover, again a point of contrast, whereas many of the uh, migrants who came to uh, the US have professional background, uh, in Europe, in general, we're talking about um, people really with rural farming backgrounds, uh, certainly very working class, which I'm not sure is a term uh, that translates so well over here, so we're talking about a community with a very different um, social capital. Now, if we think about the uh, impact of the events of 9-11, uh, and for us in the UK, the events of the 7-7 London bombings, uh, what impact has that had on communities which, rather like Detroit, I think, uh, communities that have suffered from a period of post-industrialization, um, we can see a number of things going on. Uh, an interesting um, thing that happened was that the government uh, developed uh, a whole series of policies which for the very first time um, were directed at Muslims. And of course this gave rise to many great fears of Islamophobia, and it's true that in the UK, um, there are very serious issues in terms of public attitudes towards Muslims. This is one battle um, that Muslims have not uh, been able to win in the UK, although I think in many ways that the intensity of the discourses uh, is much less in the UK um, than it is over here in the US, partly because of um, substantial funding. But an interesting a dynamic occurred, and it brings me back to this point about locality. The government spent about £60 million on a Preventing Violent Extremism programme. And this programme was targeted at what we might call um, soft power. It was a way of trying to win the hearts and minds of Muslims. Now we have a very serious uh, reservation about this, because it really securitised the whole debate about what we call in the UK community cohesion, issues around integration and so on. So there was a, com a conflation of security discourses and integration discourses. But it's interesting that the UK, although it rolled back rhetorically on issues around multiculturalism, this whole advent of the £60 million pound prevent programme actually was rolled out at a local level and gave rise to uh, a new Muslim civil society in the UK because grants were managed at local level, because they were funded very much to try and win the hearts and minds of Muslims, um, there was a large sense in which Muslims were partners in trying to build up the capacity of the communities uh, to develop uh, things that they also felt were important for them. And it's a commentary in many ways too on governance. Uh, governance often seen as a top-down, uh, controlling, disciplining, regulating activity. And we lose sight too sometimes of the role of agency. The agency of local governance which has very often uh, huge investments in locally powerful ethnic communities. If we look at a city like uh, Bradford, which I've studied in the north of England, uh, Muslims there are a very, very strong 
a voting bloc. So Bradford, for instance, refused um, the money from the local, from the central government. It refused to be part of the Prevent program because it, it was clear that it would compromise um, very vulnerable community relations. In the end, the government was so keen for them to have the money to do the cohesion work that they said, right, just get on, do whatever you want. So we can see that um, something that's as uh, powerful as a, a state-led investment uh, in preventing violent extremism can get renegotiated at the local level depending on local power dynamics. And it was something too that Muslims were very much uh, agents in. Uh, Muslims were part of commissioning bodies for awarding the various grants and uh, this money uh, was uh, very productive in many ways in terms of helping a community that was vulnerable, helping a community that lacked capacity uh, to do a number of things that they wanted to do. So it's interesting that this sort of provides some sort of uh, commentary on local governments, local dynamics, um, that um, throws a number of issues back to the way in which the, government, uh, the governance of Muslims plays out uh, in the UK. As I say, this does not uh, challenge the very significant issues that Muslims face in terms of broad structuring discourses in the media and the way in which uh, Muslims are framed in the media. There's a very strong, strong sense in, in which Muslims are making exceptional claims for recognition. This is the strong uh, discourse that we can often identify. And yet, in terms of political participation, uh, we can see many examples of the way in which Muslims have been working uh, across communities with Christians, uh, with Jews, with other faith-based groups. Um, something that's really rather important in the UK, given that there is an established church. So, in Europe, uh, we often see uh, society characterised as secular. There's a lot of sociology, sociology of religion um, that's come through in recent years that's really looked at deconstructing this idea of the secular West. And then the key contrast that's often drawn is between secular Europe and uh, religious um, American society. But the UK is rather unusual in that it has an established church. And it's an established church that has not sought to uh, lord it over religious minorities. Rather, in some ways, the presence of religious minorities has been deeply invigorating for a fairly liberal church, a church that has taken a role as an uh, advocate for uh, communities that sometimes lack capacity, as I've mentioned. And, and so we have seen positive relationships evolve in terms of a faith sector in the UK, one that clearly provides various opportunities uh, for Muslims as Muslims to organise in society, something that perhaps is not at all um, something that exists over in France, for instance, where we have a much more secular, laic um, society, where it's very difficult to talk publicly about religion. And we have a religion question in the UK census, we have done since 2001. So again, there's a way in which religion is part of public discourse in the UK. And that's something that Muslims have, again, actively fought for over a number of decades. If we rewind to the 1960s and 1970s, when Muslims began to establish their communities, there was no protection whatsoever for Muslims. The dominant discourse about difference in the UK was principally around race. But because Muslims are such a significant minority, because of the way in which Muslim consciousness has been impacted by global events from the Rushdie affair through to events of 9-11, this sense of Muslims as a distinctive community is something that has begun to grow. And of course, Muslims are responding dynamically to uh, 
um, Islamophobia and this targeting of Muslims as um, the principal other within Europe. So we can see the way in which Muslims have identified issues around, <coughs> excuse me, around um, their protection in terms of religious discrimination, uh, pushing these issues forward through the 1990s and finding success eventually in the 2000s. So we can see in the UK a situation where Muslims have been increasingly recognised by the state and white society but have been increasingly regulated too in many ways. I don't know whether I can hand back to you at that point. Simon. Yeah, 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 that's, that's great. Um, we'll, we can go for what, another 20 minutes? Another one comes up? You want to do that? Okay. Uh, I, I think one of the main differences that we find in the American context is this issue of the private versus public support. Uh, in Britain, there is uh, a presumption uh, that the government uh, will help uh, with underwriting projects, uh, will in fact in many ways provide uh, the guidelines for these projects. And as a result of uh, budgetary issues, we find that there is uh, sometimes more money, uh, sometimes more money than they had expected, or money being specifically earmarked for certain projects like the PREVENT uh, project. But then again, in the year 2010, uh, the, uh, the budget cuts some areas that are absolutely critical and directly going to impact Muslim communities. For example, the Department of uh, Communities and Local Governments has its budget slashed by 40%? Uh, or was it 51%? I think it was 40. Was it 40? 40% 40. 40 of the budget is just immediately slashed. And so a lot of these projects, and certainly the Muslim community was... Uh, a direct and a, and a large beneficiary that simply vanish. Now one can go ahead and spin a yarn of saying, well, this is a discriminatory thing, uh, this is targeting Muslims, but in a sense, I mean, the, the pen of, uh, of, of slashing budgets is, uh, is fairly non-discriminatory. I mean, something has to give somewhere if there's just not enough money. And then something else which seems to be uh, on its face for some, uh, uh, again, a discriminatory practice, is really not. The education budget is slashed dramatically in, uh, in England, and a disproportionate amount of the public that is affected happen to be Muslims. So you find that these uh, reliances on uh, education and on the CLG, the community and local governments, for programs that can help Muslims, that can enable them, that can uh, bolster them, whether it is uh, a sense of belonging or identity, these things getting cut has a disproportionate impact. And for those people who are already uh, teetering in a very difficult area, in a very precarious position, uh, suffer the more. By contrast, in the, in the American context, there isn't really this reliance on the government coming in and providing subsidies for programs. It is very much more a private initiative which is undertaken. And <coughs> excuse me, it creates a cultural consciousness among American Muslims to say, right, if we want to do something, if we need to have these spaces created, uh, we need to create them ourselves. And it's a matter of looking within the community for these kinds of initiatives and for the kind of funding that then would be required. At the same time as American Muslims become more adept to uh, the system of grant writing, of understanding where the money might be coming from other private foundations, they similarly then are availing themselves of this as other groups have before. So the notion then of whether it is on a local level or on a federal level, the sense of reliance or dependency, or in some cases one might argue over-dependency, doesn't really exist. At the same time, this country is just so big that it's sometimes difficult to identify how these things are happening on an aggregate level. It is usually, almost by definition, something on a local level that we find. And of course, in the metro Detroit area, we are quite uh, privy to some very successful projects, some which may not necessarily be branded entirely Islamic in, nation, in nature or Muslim but clearly a very large proportion of those who benefit from it happen to be Muslim. And of course, access uh, is, is one of the sterling examples of, of how this is done, which is uh, 
And I always forget the acronym because you've got your other acronym in my head. Tim. Thank you very much. Uh, but the American Arab uh, Community uh, Center. Center of uh, Economic and Social Services, yeah. something like that. And, uh, and so these kinds of in initiatives, or if you will, a private entrepreneurship, is coming about. But I want to get back to this issue of the transatlantic context. I think that there's something really important to change the way of thinking to not just be between the quote-unquote diaspora community or the immigrant community and how it relates to the quote-unquote home country. This is by and large becoming uh, an unhelpful uh, dynamic to focus on entirely or even primarily. That there are a lot of evolutionary tracks that should be studied between the Muslim experience in Europe, the Muslim experience in the UK, and notice I do consider these to be different because as you said, they are different not lumping everything east of the Atlantic to be just one big group, and that in the United States. How are these communities growing? What similarities do they have? What differences do they have? Uh, Dr. McLaughlin has said that there, there are some uh, clear uh, uh, similarities, and then there are some glaring differences. I mean, the United States does not have a colonial legacy uh, uh, with, with, uh, with mu the Muslim world, uh, contrary to people calling it a colonial or a neo-colonial relationship now. Distance has a lot to do with this. From the UK, uh, for these countries to be connected with their home countries, so to speak, uh, especially Pakistan, you've got London Heathrow, London Gatwick, Manchester, Glasgow, Birmingham, and during the summertime, Leeds Bradford Airport. So you have about five or six airports in a rather small country by which people can go daily to Pakistan, and the flight is somewhere between seven to eight hours, which is less than the time it takes me to get to London, by and large. From the United States, if one were wanting to travel to Pakistan, for example, you'd have to think twice or thrice before you even want to make the journey, because it's at least twice as long. It's going to re uh, require more connections. If those do not, uh, of, of you who do not live in major cities have to go to a secondary city, it requires another connection once you get to Pakistan. So that has a big impact on thinking of your relationship with that country. Satellite ethnic television. Now I know Al Jazeera is very popular here, but the level of uh, immersion of the community, especially the Pakistani community, and I would even add the, uh, the Arab community, to these channels and the kind of confinement that it creates is quite different. So locality. One might be sitting in Bradford, but if one is, for all intents and purposes, sitting in Lahore, Pakistan, because of the immersion of satellite ethnic television, this creates quite a big difference in how one perceives their place of belonging. Now, I mean, I've, I've been to Bradford as well, and some of the youth that I interviewed, they said, we just don't feel comfortable being at home anymore because the television is always talking about Pakistan. It doesn't tell me anything about the life that I know around me. There's zero contextuality. So they'd rather hang out in the city center until all hours of the day and night than go home. So safe spaces like the home are becoming increasingly unavailable to many of these youth. That is fortunately not a problem in the United States in any great measure. And part of it, of course, is because America is just so big that there's more breathing space uh, by which they can uh, uh, really move around. So we find then that when it comes to the American context, uh, these differences, whether it is a private uh, and public funding, whether it is uh, spatial issues of distance and how these form identity, have some similarities and some differences. But at the same time, I think it is so important for the American model and especially the British model to be studied together, to try to understand how these similarities and these differences uh, inform one another, because I think that there's some examples in the British context of what does work, that lessons from that can be learned in the American arena, and certainly there's some best practices of the American context that can be employed in England, especially as there are efforts now underway to wean people off from the public trust. Mm -hmm. And so people now are ripe in England for understanding, okay, you cut the umbilicus from the state from us, how do we then fill in the void? And so this idea of small private entrepreneurship is growing in, in uh, the UK. 
where you have private benefactors, private foundations, private entrepreneurs who are funding projects as opposed to funding businesses? Yes, I mean, I think that I would qualify that. And I think that one of the, you're absolutely right to say, of course, that when there was a shift in government uh, from the Labour, which is a sort of left-leaning, um, centrist sort of um, government, to a more conservative and right-wing government, in the context of the um, global economic downturn, but also ideologically, um, there was a withdrawing of this um, large um, support for Muslim organisations, and that has um, forced Muslims to look to other sources. I think the problem is that Muslim communities in the UK are still developing in terms of capacity, and a sense in which this, uh, this moment of withdrawal really came at a terribly bad time. Um, there's a sense in which the five years or so since 7-7 um, did see a fluorescence of uh, Muslim civil society. Um, there was a sense of participation, a sense of penetration of young, able, second generation, third generation, um, smart people into the system. And as this system has shrunk, as the state has become smaller, um, there are uh, many, many questions about um, where these uh, people are now going to uh, pursue their concerns. To, to bring us back to the question of tr transnationalism, one significant contrast that um, became very clear to me this afternoon was that whereas um, the city of Bradford is deeply and intimately connected still to the homeland, um, it may interest you to know that about 70% of marriages that are contracted are contracted um, back home still. So there's a, a, a strong tradition <coughs> of intermarrying between kin, uh, but also uh, marrying across continents is seen as a way of maintaining uh, migration in an age when the state is seeking to constrain that. So Bradford is deeply connected to Pakistan and its villages through marriage. It's also deeply connected historically through its parochial kinship-based politics. And a really fascinating case of the acculturation of British and Pakistani cultures is the way that kinship-based activists in Bradford managed to penetrate the local Labour Party. So the local Labour Party, with a strong and uh, interesting history of its own, became a sort of vehicle for um, clan politics. What we don't see in Bradford are conflicts back home uh, being played out um, in the streets of the city. Um, Kashmir, which is the home of so many of the Muslims in Bradford, is a contested state between Pakistan and India. And yet those politics have not really played out strongly amongst the population. But um, this clan politics has historically been very, very significant in the city. Um, but recently, just very recently in 2000. And um, uh, ten, we saw a upswelling of um, opposition to that from the young generation. So you talk about the sense in which young people in Bradford really resent this sense of connectedness back home, and they don't feel that sense of connectedness. And what they did was they uh, protested. Um, the way in which clan politics have assimilated uh, mainstream politics in Bradford by voting for a, uh, a far-left candidate, um, George Galloway, who was part of a Respect Party. The Respect Party emerged out of a Stop the War coalition, which protested the 2003 invasion of Iraq. 
And so a sense in which an alternative consciousness, which protested against the way in which Britain had um, exercised its, its foreign policy, but also something that was deeply local in the way in which these parochial uh, clan politicians had dominated the political scene in Bradford, really gives some sense of um, social change in the city, the sense in which there's perhaps um, a generational turn uh, in the offing. So we can see social change, but it's happening really rather slowly. And this is really significant if we think about the journey that many of the migrants have made over the last 50 years or so. We're really talking about communities that have moved from a, a situation of rural peasantry. Many came as illiterate workers to Bradford's mud, woolen mills. And so their journey uh, into modernity, into post-modernity, has been incredibly rapid compared to um, the mainstream uh, industrial population. So things are working out. Uh, things are uh, beginning to change, but it's a slow, slow process. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, what is lost sometimes, because we just take it for granted these days, is that uh, what is the effect of urbanization? I mean, the, the movement, even for somebody in the state of Michigan, coming from uh, some small village up in uh, uh, near Traverse City, coming to the big cities of Ann Arbor or to Detroit and all, I mean, it's a profound change of... Uh, of culture, uh, it's, it's a profound change of, uh, of cultural sensitivities and identity and how to fit in in this ever, ever moving world. And then take that for somebody from the Midwest and how one is sometimes treated, often in a patronizing way or a condescending way by people on either coast. Uh, so, so these kinds of uh, bodies in motion as migration, whether within a country, sort of trans, uh, uh, I guess we wouldn't call it transnationalism, you would, uh, but, but sort of an intranational uh, movement, uh, plays a very big role. I think in the case of, uh, and again, it's fascinating because of the clan politics and its impact on Bradford politics, in, in, in Detroit and in the Dearborn area, we do see certain manifestations of that. Uh, clearly right now with the uh, situation in Syria, we see that there are tectonic plates within uh, the, the Arab American community. We see uh, lines are being drawn between uh, Syrian Sunni Muslims on the one hand, Syrian Shi'i Muslims on the other, and Syrian Christians coming into the fray are then the Lebanese and uh, their parallel groups on that side of the equation or that side of the border. But it seems as though more than playing out on the local political end, it's more of a matter of how the politics among communities are shaped by foreign policy. There isn't really so much of a matter that, well, I'm voting for a particular candidate in a particular locale because of that person's foreign policy bona fides on the Syrian uh, issue or on the Lebanese issue or on the Iraqi issue. So it's not necessarily refracting itself to who's going to be mayor of Dearborn or who's going to be the congressperson from uh, the district including Dearborn. So I think that that's, uh, that's one uh, major uh, difference. Well, we're coming up on uh, 7.10, and we're here till 7.30. Uh, so I just thought um, we'd open it up for some questions. And oh, there we go. Wow. I, I wonder if uh, we could step back and do a, uh, a chronological comparison of the UK and the United States on the history of Islamophobia over the last, well, since 9-11. And clearly, uh, I have the sense that we're talking about some similar tra tra trajectories, but also different dynamics at work in England, and obviously 7-7 intervenes in a, a profound way, uh, but the uh, Professor Kahn's discussion of uh, the <coughs> discovery that there are fewer Muslims among us than we thought does not, uh, it doesn't fit your description of a relatively large uh, Muslim population. 
So I, I wonder if you might yeah. explore I mean, in terms of, that last decade. In terms of chronology, we have to rewind uh, much <coughs> before 9-11, really. So um, in many ways, the, the contemporary discussion about Islamophobia uh, finds at least some of its roots in Britain, and that's something that's been picked up and, and has been talked about in the US and in Europe. So what we have to do is we have to go back to that context that I was talking about, where really the whole dominant discourse around difference in the UK in the 70s and the 80s was dominated by race. And what we find at that point are a number of uh, Muslim activists, very grassroots, very local level, who were not finding that the local state was able to hear about their concerns about accommodation around uh, religious issues. Now this bubbles to the surface during the Salman Rushdie affair in 1988-89. This is a real focus in many ways for a shift in discourse uh, and in terms of the visibility of Muslims. And it's also a convergence of um, change that's happening within Britain in terms of um, a frustrated minority that demographically is seeing for the first time the emergence of a British-born generation that's much less prepared to accept things as compared to its parents. But we're also seeing at this point the way in which global issues are beginning to really cross-cut um, the UK situation. So it's in this context that we see Muslims actively protesting the way in which um, the state uh, recognises religion, the way in which the state is prepared to um, hear Muslims speak as Muslims. So the Islamophobia discourse comes out sometime after the Rushdie affair in a report um, by a trust, a race relations trust, which had previously worked on anti-Semitism, um, and it, it, it talks about the way in which in British society we can see clearly Muslims self-identifying as Muslims and yet having no recourse to protection in the law, in terms of policy, as Muslims. So there was a kind of misrecognition going on there. Now all of that gets um, intensified, of course, uh, in a post 9-11 um, context, but it's really after 7-7 that that's taken up with, with great vigour. And um, what we can see as part of this kind of fluorescence of civil society that I was talking about are a number of Muslim advocacy organisations emerging that are beginning now to really police this whole area of Islamophobia. Um, there's a, a fairly, I mean, I think there are a lot of British entrepreneurs that have used the Prevent Agenda to um, do what they want. There's a, a Faith Matters organisation that is run by a Muslim, and um, they've just set up a programme which has full state support uh, called uh, Tell Mama, and it's, 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 um, it's a way of reporting anti-Muslim, uh, Islamophobic uh, incidents in the UK. So this, this is becoming much more formalised um, than it, it had been hitherto. Um, that was the Running Me Trust, right? The Running Me yeah. Trust, yeah. 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 Um, I, th I think that, and thank you for the question, Dr. Kerman, I think that the idea of a chronology is helpful. The public face of Islam since the 1960s was one that was both, for many Americans, a matter of ambivalence, and it was also located as an indigenous face. Uh, for most Americans, if they were to perceive of Islam or of Muslims, the face of Malcolm X uh, would be there, and then Muhammad Ali, and again, maybe Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Again, three African Americans, so there wasn't a kind of foreignness that was involved. This all changes in 1979 with the Iranian Revolution. The public face, and imagine a Michael Jackson video where the faces morph. 
that morphs into Khomeini. And Ayatollah Khomeini now represents Islam, and it is gruff, it is uh, foreboding, it is threatening, and it is religious. It is theological, it is inescapable because of the turban and everything. In fact, if anything, it falls into the exact trope of the demon other, and especially hearkening back to this fairly long tradition of uh, anti-Islamic tropes dating back to even before the Crusades, that this is the, uh, the Saracen, the infidel, and this is what he looks like. And so this was at a time during the Cold War where Nostradamus's prophecies were being reinterpreted to say that the Soviet Union and Iran were now going to form this axis from Moscow to Tehran and uh, threaten, threaten existentially the United States, which of course was laughable given the fact that if Khomeini had contempt for any other country uh, than the United States and well, Israel, it was the Soviet Union and its godless communism. But of course that was something that Nostradamus didn't pick up on apparently in the 14th century. <laughs> As you move forward, again, you have then in 1990, 1991, the Gulf War, which isn't necessarily seen in a, as an Islamic war or an Islamic conflict. There is some kind of novel curiosity about the Rushdie affair, wondering why are they protesting about a book. You find that some literary uh, luminaries like Norman Mailer and Susan Sontag take this as a cause celeb. But by and large, the Rushdie affair seemed to be so much within the, uh, the, the zone of Khomeini, because Khomeini was the one who issued the fatwa, that they're like, well, there he goes again. Uh, this is just something else that Khomeini would do, and it was more of a demonization of Iran than it was something that was uh, spread to the entire Muslim world. It was a bit more localized. 9-11, of course, is a major moment. Uh, and then there are certain uh, events that, of course, keep the fuel alit, uh, whether it's the March 11th or the 3-11-2004 uh, Madrid bombings or the 7-7-2005 bombings. Nonetheless, it seems as though if one takes a look at the public polling about attitudes toward Islam, they're still relatively okay right after 9-11. And then there's a slow bleed as the war progresses and as people's contact with the imagery of war uh, seems to be intensifying. Uh, 311 and 77 don't se seem to provide any significant change in that uh, trajectory. There, doesn't, there don't appear to be any sharp declines. But 2007, though, seems to really indicate a watershed. And this, of course, is leading up to the 2008 elections. And in 2008, Islam becomes a political issue, or Muslims become a political issue. And so we find then that as uh, the president-elect, uh, or I should say the candidacy, is now forged in the nomination of Obama, there seems to be a wake-up moment for America to say, wow, things are getting much more alienized or otherized with a candidate who is uh, not like what appears on the currency of the United States, shall we say. So as this is now moving forward, we find another milestone, and that is the summer before the 2010 elections. For those of you who don't remember, this was the summer of the Park 51 controversy, the so-called Ground Zero Mosque, and also concomitant with that, the uh, Quran burning uh, fetishes of uh, Terry Jones, a preacher from Florida. So all of a sudden, as we're moving to, and remember, 2010 is not the 10th anniversary of 9-11. I know that many people are really wedded to this base 10 model of the world, that everything has to happen in 10s, but this is happening in 9s. But yet there is this fervor, and the only thing that can explain why it's happening in an off 10 year is that the elections are coming up, the midterm elections. And so you find that this new moment toward anti-Sharia legislation becomes very convenient. It is a cheap and easy victory because there isn't this wellspring of uh, opposition, either from the Muslim community or from other political sectors to push back upon that. 2012, though, changes things dramatically. You find that the Muslim issue is rather subdued because of either the economy or this singular focus on trying to defeat the, uh, the incumbent president. It doesn't work, and in fact, if anything, it galvanizes in a loose network a lot of these demographic groups who come together and re-elect the president. 
So that seems to be the arc of, uh, of Islam within the United States and the relationship of how the public has perceived it. Now, of course, it's an open question after what has happened in Boston to see how this is occurring. But what we do find, though, is that uh, there is, to use the word trending, uh, some new vigor when it comes to certain opinion makers who are countering the narrative of presumption that this must be a Muslim actor. You find that people like Glenn Greenwald or Salon.com with um, David Sirota are actually writing articles saying, for example, Sirota wrote an article saying, please let it be a white American to then expose the double standard that America has. So in a sense, what you have is a bunch of social commentators who are not necessarily completely empathetic toward Muslims. I mean, I'm not going to question their motives at all or challenge them on this. But certainly, they're holding up a mirror to American society and say, is this as, as, as good as you can do? And so what, what we're finding then is that there's a contestation using Islam as kind of a ping pong match between forces on the political and social left and forces um, on the political and the social right. Because in many ways, the Muslim community in America has become the canary in the coal mine. That what happens to this community, whether it's on issues of security and surveillance, on issues of civil rights, on the issues of visibility and space and relevance, are then going to be coming soon to a theater near you, among these other groups. Yes. Um, so uh, you discussed how uh, <coughs> the government in, uh, in Britain, they're, uh, they're spending money internally. And uh, but in my opinion, I don't think that solves the problem here. Because as you said, that uh, Muslims are linked globally to each other. If, if something happens to them outside, they think that they're being targeted inside. So how about the foreign policy here? Uh, we didn't talk about it here. Why, why has it been changing in the, uh, changes in the foreign policy to, to yes. affect the Muslims, uh, yes. whether it's in the US or in the United Kingdom? Yes, I mean, this is a very um, significant point. Muslims do not feel that they've been able to affect um, these grievance-related issues. Some of the earlier articulations of the prevent policy um, went some distance to trying to at least have a conversation about grievance, but more recently that's fallen off the agenda. So Muslims don't feel that they've been able to have an impact in terms of um, foreign policy, and that's perhaps not surprising um, when you think about what sort of size constituency we're talking about. Now, I guess that some Muslims too have also had to become very pragmatic about these issues, and they look to, to the Ummah on their doorstep and its social uh, condition. Um, so I think this is one of the, the challenges, the difficulties, um, of all diasporas, that they have what some scholars call a double consciousness. They can see things from different ways. And if we look at any diaspora throughout history, even from ancient times, um, this has been um, their, their challenge, really. So I don't, I don't see that that's something that the, the British Muslims can really expect uh, to impact, although it's likely to be an ongoing a cause of concern to them. So this dynamic is not going to change, um, I don't think, in the near future. I mean, from the American context, and I would, I would submit also from the British context, that those people who were protesting the Iraq war were not all Muslims. Uh, in fact, it was a much larger coalition. And yet, and I think the Iraq war is very, uh, it's very educational and the way that things are handled, that despite not only some very overwhelming and a vociferous opposition to it from the public, and along with that, some fairly compelling evidence that this was not um, a, a valid war, at least that the rationales that were being presented and submitted by uh, both Mr. Blair and Bush were flawed to say the least, that the countries were still going full-throatedly toward war. And I think that this demonstrated to a lot of people and cultivated a cynicism that in many ways uh, democracies are not really fully democratic 
in the sense that the popular will will be exercised. And that was something that at the same time could have been seen by Muslims to say, oh well, here we go again, we are still voiceless. But the recognition that it was no longer personalized to them. That if there was in fact a political agenda or a policy agenda by governments, that these things were going to happen irrespective of facts, irrespective of truth, I mean again, perceived, and uh, irrespective of, of, of the public will. And this perhaps then helped to enhance the optimism in the electoral process that if we then uh, avail ourselves of that, at least that will mean we've tried to do something. It may be in vain, but at least we've done as much as we can working within the system. And so, again, it's very hard to find candidates who are going to exercise your political agenda and your aspirations completely. Uh, there, is, there is a change that happens in 2008, a new president is elected, and there is an intensification of drone attacks in, in Pakistan and, uh, and in Afghanistan. Uh, and, of course, most Muslims vote in 2012 for the incumbent who is still persisting with such policy, yet rationalize it by saying it could be so much worse had the other one come in. Interestingly though, and this I think marks a very important shift, the negotiation about who, for whom to vote was not based only on foreign policy, which used to be a very common uh, element among many immigrant Muslims particularly, and this is what caused the chasm with the indigenous Muslims, that they were voting primarily on a candidate's foreign policy bona fides and his uh, uh, agenda. Now the negotiation was saying, well, Yes, he's doing this in the foreign policy realm, but we're going to be better protected at home. Yeah. I mean, I think the electoral example is very interesting in the UK. So what we see in the early part of the 2000s is a backlash against um, the incumbent Labour Party. So we can see, we can point to uh, Muslim uh, localities, localities where there are strong Muslim votes, um, actually throwing Labour out of power. But what we see a number of years later is that they come back just into the same old position. So there's a period of reaction, but then the status quo reasserts itself. So, you know, it's, it's, it's something that is, is, is transient. Yeah. Want to end on a political question? Um, Sean, would you like to just um, give some concluding remarks then about, uh, about either things already said or things yet to be said? Ah, well, um, well I was quite intrigued by your uh, comments about the, the Hajj, actually, because that's an upcoming uh, research project of mine. Um, well, you know, in order to get in, you've got to convert. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's uh, so much you can see on TV these days, but... Um, <laughs> Yes, I mean, I think that, that that's quite an interesting point to finish on, perhaps. And if we think about um, the, the sort of triad of homeland, old homeland, new, and the, the broader Muslim world, um, the example of Hajj perhaps shows us that you know, not all Muslim connectedness to places and people elsewhere are deeply politicized. There's a kind of routine um, participation in broader transnational circulations. We're drawn uh, very often to a focus on the political, whether it's in terms of the impact of homeland uh, movements uh, in the diaspora or homeland politics in the diaspora. But for me, there's also this sort of broader transnational public um, sphere that is Islamic and Muslim and incorporates just a sense of being in a world where uh, in terms of religious practice, maybe even religious tourism, in terms of consumption. I mean, I think this is fascinating where is um, been interesting work in the UK more recently on modest fashion and the way in which that broader context of Islamic revival, particularly amongst middle classes, right. um, have um, 
produced a sort of Islamized um, consumer culture, which I think you know brings us back to Paris Hilton. And, it all um, comes back to Paris Hilton. So. <laughs> well, well and, and, and I think that's that's absolutely right. Uh, I was having a conversation with somebody yesterday, as a matter of fact, that there is um, in Chicago a hijab design conference underway. So a group of Muslim women. Do you know about this? Yeah. I okay. Uh, get, getting together to uh, to design fashionable, cool, uh, and yet still attractive uh, headscarf, and, and yet maintain their Islamic sensibilities and their modesty. And it's interesting what the impetus is for some of these uh, these designers. Uh, a scholar a colleague of mine asked them, "What, what, and why are you doing this?" And she said, "We are fed up with Muslim men." ignoring us for in favor of white and Latino women. This is, this is why they're, they're trying to design. They're saying, look at us. What's wrong with us? We can be attractive to you. And uh, this colleague of mine said, well, that's a great idea because it is all about biological impulses. I mean, we are human before we are whatever other category of identity we ascribe to ourselves. But she says, Okay, let's say, for example, that uh, you have the right headscarf, that this just turns heads and becomes a magnet. Muslim guy comes up to you and says, hi, now what? <laughs> and the, 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 the girl said, I don't know. I never thought about that. <laughs> and this, I think, really then captures what we're dealing with when it comes to identity. Identity and the navigation of a public sphere is several doors. And whether you look at trying to find the combination to open up the first door, realize that there's many behind that. And for them, you may be able to design the perfect hijab to then at least have the guy look at you and say, hi, what do you do and what do you bring to the table after that? Because the white and Latina girl, and this is what my colleague told him, she says, they've already got the script. They know what to say. They know how to act. They know how to reel them in. <laughs> what do you know about that? What is your cultural lexicon? What is your ability to then open up those other doors? That then becomes the challenge, especially when you're talking about transnationalism, when you're talking about all of these other forces. But at the same time, and at least to end on an optimistic note, the first door has been opened, or at least the way that people are starting to think about this relationship has already been known, instead of still being in denial or in the cloud of its existence. So, And I would just add that actually this, this is all negotiated, although it's transnationally collective, yeah. um, the style of uh, modest fashion is going to be negotiated locally. Um, it's participating in a global circulation. It's impacted by that. And yet it's going to be a bit vernacular sure. negotiation. So the style of uh, performing, of dressing, um, as a, 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 an American Muslim or a British Muslim, um, it's going to have that sense of connectedness, but it's also going to be um, distinctiveness and lo uh, distinctively and locally negotiated. And, that, and that's going to be a challenge. I mean, it's going to go from the global to the local to the global to the local. I mean, that's just part of a dialectic, which uh, at, the same, at, the, at the same time that it is kind of frightening to wonder where is it going to be at any given point, I think still provides guarded optimism that it's a dynamic process. So with that, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Coming. Uh, among my students who are here, there's a sign-up sheet going around. Please sign it if you want your credit. Um, otherwise, I will deny its existence if I don't have it in my hands. Uh, thank you for coming uh, on hopefully what now is becoming a clearer evening. Uh, thank you to the Center for Citizenship Studies, Dr. Mark Cruman and Helen. Thank you for organizing this. Thank you to the British Council and Tim Rivera. And again, once again, thank you, Dr. Sean Obama. Thank you, thank you.